Uh, good morning. Can I welcome everybody to the 29th meeting of the Education and Culture Committee in 2014? Uh, can I remind everybody uh, who is present that all electronic devices should be switched off at all times because they do interfere with the broadcasting system? Uh, today is our first evidence session on the BSL Bill, and so our meeting will be interpreted in BSL. Uh, can I welcome our BSL interpreters, uh, Shauna Dixon and Paul Belmont? Uh, you're very welcome. And I hope you have a pleasant day here at the committee. Um, our first item is uh, to welcome Chick Brody to the committee, um, who is our new member, who is in, uh, coming here in place of Claire Adamson. I am sure all members will join me in paying tribute to Claire, who was a member of the committee from the start of session four and, and has been a very assiduous member of the committee. So I wish Claire well on the new committees that uh, she is moving on to. Uh, but can I invite Chick to declare any relevant registrable interests? I have no relevant registrable interests. Thank you very much. Our next item is to take evidence on the British Sign Language Scotland Bill. This is our first evidence session on the Bill, and can I welcome Mark Griffin, who is a member in charge of the Bill, and is supporting officials from the Scottish Parliament, Joanna Hardy, Non-Government Bills Unit, and Neil Ross, Principal Legal Officer. Our intention today is to focus on the policy intentions of the Bill, uh, and the meeting takes place while our call for evidence is still open. Um, the reason we are doing this is to help those who are considering making a response by allowing them to hear uh, Mark Griffin's evidence uh, to us today in advance of making a submission. Uh, Mark will, of course, come back uh, further on in the process to give us uh, extra evidence at the end, uh, and he will respond to all the other relevant evidence that has come in uh, during uh, the process. So, uh, welcome very, very much welcome, uh, Mark, to the committee. Uh, this morning. Uh, can I begin, Mark, um, uh, by going straight into uh, questions uh, on the bill itself? And I'm going to begin by asking uh, Mary to start us off. Thank you, Mark. Um, since this Parliament was set up in 1999, there has been no shortage of initiatives on British Sign Language. I won't read them out to you, uh, but in our paper today, there are seven separate initiatives on BSL between 2000 and 2011. So given this uh, fairly long history of policy on promoting BSL, uh, why is a statutory response to this issue now required? And really what I'm asking is in what specific ways will your bill, will this bill succeed where uh, previous efforts I wouldn't say have failed, but have perhaps not gone far enough. Yep, I mean, I, I think there have been initiatives before, and it's clear that there is good work ongoing out there. I mean, you have Dingwall Academy doing um, excellent work, HMP Perth training their staff in uh, BSL, uh, museums and galleries translating information into BSL, massive, massive amounts of information and BSL, so it's clear that there are pockets of excellent practice um, going on round about the country, um, but that doesn't mean it's happening everywhere. What this bill will do is, that I think the first thing would um, place that obligation on the, the government to promote the use of BSL, um, put it on an equal footing um, with the Gaelic language in Scotland so that um, people who use BSL and in fact don't have the opportunity to learn any other language other than BSL felt that they feel just as important as any other language group in, in Scotland. And really to end that sort of postcode service of, of provision, I know there have been studies, reports even into just single areas like action on hearing loss had a study just on social work services. Um, for deaf and hard of hearing users and that across the 32 local authorities um, performance was, was very, very variable and that this bill would try and um, the government would coordinate the actions that public authorities were taking, give them a strategic policy lead through the, the national plan and really say clearly that we value British Sign Language as the government have already done um, when Shona Robson was the Public Health Minister, they clearly value British Sign Language to put that on a statutory footing. 
I visited Dingwall Academy and I totally am pleased you mentioned it because it's a wonderful centre of excellence and they're very proud of uh, their teaching in British Sign Language. Would you, uh, given the size of the Highlands, um, the most uh, uh, sparsely populated area uh, of Scotland, uh, would the excellence in Dingwall, will your uh, bill allow children throughout, if I could use the example, all of the Highlands and all of Scotland to have a higher level of uh, access to BSL and their families, of course. Yep. The bill would be the starting point to the government promoting the use of BSL. I mean, Dingwall Academy were down in the Parliament and I spoke to the pupils and they were, I mean, I think it's fair to say they loved learning BSL. Um, and they were disappointed that after first and second year that they weren't able to take that further because of pressure on um, their studies and other, and other subjects. So I think this bill does give the government that platform to take forward the excellent curriculum that Dingwall Academy have, have developed and see that being replicated across, across Scotland. My second question is, if I may read from the policy memorandum, just one sentence. The intention is that by placing this obligation on the Scottish Government, the profile of the language will be heightened in its use and delivery. So basically you're asking for BSL plans to be prepared and published by ministers and local authorities. Um, does that go far enough? Are you ex I mean, to publish a plan isn't a guarantee that more people will learn BSL. It's a sort of publishing an intention, if you like. And I just wondered if you had any specific improvements or outcomes that you would like to see as a result of the bill. And if I can just say, we did go to Falkirk with the committee. And again, that was another centre of excellence. So if they publish a plan and add on to the excellent work they're doing, that's wonderful. But if we go to another local authority, where the base is very low, publishing a plan of progress may be pretty minimal. Uh, and so I'm just wondering if in your mind, what are you, what's your expectations for improvements and outcomes as a result of the bill? I mean, literally what will happen as a result of the bill will be that um, public authorities will publish their plans and then the, the crucial point for me will be that performance review um, and I know I've set that as three, four years down the line after the plan has have been published but I'm open to, to variation on that. But that performance review um, which the Minister will then report to in, in Parliament will give BSL users in their own community for the first time ever um, through those performance reviews to say why is my local authority in for my own example, North Lanarkshire, why are they not doing um, or taking forward the excellent work that's happening in, in Dingwall Academy and give our constituents the op opportunity to come to us to challenge the Minister, or hopefully the, the Minister for, for British Sign Language as to why these authorities aren't um, performing as, as well as their neighbouring authorities. I mean, that will be the literal outcome of, of the bill, but more broadly, um, what I, I hope to see as a result of the bill will be increased awareness of the bill that public authorities and, the, and their increased consciousness of, of BSL will move to, to make sure that their frontline staff um, are more appropriately trained in, in BSL, that there are more opportunities to learn BSL and that uh, the language continues to, glow, to grow and flourish. That's my ultimate aim for, right, for the just My final question, Convener. Um, we have seen performance reviews over the years and we've also had uh, historical concordats and single outcome agreements and with local authorities. Um, so basically what you're looking for, the bill offers what I would term a stepping stone um, to improving BSL, but it does seem to stop short of setting clear rights for BSL users or even duties on public authorities. It's really asking, if I may say, we want you to do a little bit better than what you're doing just now. And I'm just wondering, it seems to fall short of 
the right of BSL users and their families to have access to that excellence. And I just wonder if public authorities, if there's enough incentive for them, you know, uh, to improve their services. Yes. <coughs> I mean, I, I think you're right to say that it's, it's a stepping stone. I'm not going to say that this bill is going to uh, wave the magic wand and that all of a sudden that any, any person who uses BSL is going to suddenly be able to turn up at a local authority um, first stop shop and get access to services um, immediately. I mean, I think I've set out what I expect local authorities to include in their plans and that, um, that's listed. Um, to, for the local, they can ignore that. But local authorities could ignore that if they like, if they wanted to. Well, th I've set out what they need to include in preparation of, of their authority plans. There's a whole list um, of things in, in the bill that they would have to do in terms of their um, consultation in BSL, their staff awareness of BSL, how they provide services um, and access to services in BSL. But that stepping stone starts um, at, at the government. Um, that, this bill gives the government that platform to, st to set out their policy priorities. Um, at the end of the day, it will be up to the government as to what resources they choose to, to put into their policy priorities. And if um, classes for families of, of BSL users as their ultimate policy priority, then this bill gives them the opportunity to set that in their national, their national direction and put the resources behind it. I wasn't specific in a certain area of, say, the example, the example that you'd given about classes for families of, of BSL users because I, want, I was aware that um, it would be a large sum of money um, and that I wanted to leave that open to the government of the day to set their policy priorities and decide on the resources that they could match to that. I said at um, the start before we started the question, could I ask members to ensure that they speak clearly and not too quickly, uh, to keep questions short and concise, and of course to allow a short pause after the last speaker is finished so that uh, the uh, interpreters can uh, do their job. Um, but can I now bring in Chick Brody? Good morning. <coughs> the bill, as we understand it, um, intends to promote the use of BSL. In, in that, clearly, we wish to cover those that uh, uh, can benefit from, from the understanding of BSL. I just wonder, I think it's recognised that the approach taken in the bill will not by itself close any service gaps. <coughs> and, and Mr Scanlon mentioned uh, improvements in outcomes. Why is it not attempting to close current service gaps so that there is a, a, a level playing field for all those that would benefit from others using PSL? I mean, it's setting the platform to start to, to close that gap um, by making people right across Scotland aware of exactly what public authorities are doing in the area of BSL, how they're providing their services and BSL to allow um, people to rightly challenge um, government and authorities on what they're doing. I mean, I think if we were to go on to talk about closing gaps in access to services and things, there's a danger of straying into um, equalities. And for me, this is about uh, a cultural issue. This is about a language um, and how people access services in, in their own language and, and giving people the, the platform to challenge uh, public authorities on how they are providing those services in that language. I meant to say at the beginning, by the way, I uh, congratulate you on pursuing the bill. Um, just on, on coming back to the, that business of you know, the level playing field uh, and encouraging local authorities, we mentioned uh, again, Mr. Scanlon asked you about specific improvements and outcomes. Um, should there be some measurable outcome on the outcomes on the public authorities that you seek to uh, encourage the use of BSL? 
Yep. It, it may well be that there are measurable outcomes. The government will, in setting out their national plan, will give guidance to local authorities on what, or not just local authorities, public authorities, on what should be in their plans. It, the government will then carry out their performance review as to whether they have met the objectives that they have set out at the, the start of the, the parliamentary term. So there will be that opportunity for government um, to see whether public authorities have met the, the set standard that they have set out in their guidance. Can I just pick up um, one question? If uh, a public authority, for whatever reason, does not uh, carry out the statutory duty of delivering one of these plans, what's the penalty? There's no penalty. I mean, when we were starting to look at this, uh, the consultation and the, the drafting of the legislation, we had a, a close eye to the, the Gaelic Language Act and the, the sanctions in the Gaelic Language Act basically amount to uh, the Board of the Gaelic uh, writing a letter to a particular authority to ask them to comply. Um, and I felt that the nature of the bill, the language in the bill, what we were planning to do was about um, promoting BSL, encouraging access to BSL and the positive measures that a lot of authorities are already undertaking and that inevitably there wouldn't be any formal sanction as such but that the performance review and a government minister report to parliament and to, to MSPs saying here are X, Y and Z public authorities who are doing fantastic work in the, the field of providing services in BSL, but here is one authority who hasn't even pr produced a plan. Um, here's another authority who has produced a plan but has made no effort um, to, to work towards achieving the outcomes in the plan um, and said minister saying in Parliament that is not acceptable and I expect them um, to step up to the mark and start delivering services and for us around the, the table and, and other members to be um, to be able to be approached by their constituents who will be impacted by authorities choosing not to develop um, plans and develop their services for them to be able to challenge that through their uh, MSPs. I'm concerned though that the, there's a danger that it will just become a, a, particularly in the current rather straitened circumstances that public authorities find themselves, um, do not are you not concerned that effectively it will become a tick box exercise? Well, I mean, it, it, will, it will depend on the strength of the government, the strength of the government minister, the strength of the government's national plan and the, the guidance that they set out and the resources that the government chose to, to put in. I think on reading the government's memorandum that the, the committee have been provided, I think. It is clear from that memorandum that the government have a strong understanding of BSL, that they have a strong commitment to, to BSL and in fact have went over and above um, what I have been proposing through the legislation. So I think there is a clear commitment from government in terms of uh, policy direction and resources um, to make sure that this bill is a, is a success and I am grateful for that. Thank you. Neil Buddy. Thanks, Kevin. Um, can I repeat what uh, Chief Brody said in, in welcoming you pursuing this uh, bill? I think it's a very important issue. Um, I wanted to ask you about current legislation and specifically the Quality Act 2010. Um, obviously, the, the, the Quality Act um, has been in place for a couple of years. Can I ask you why um, the protections offered by the Equality Act 2010 are not seen as sufficient to promote and facilitate the uh, promotion of BSL? It goes back to the point I made earlier that I do not see um, provision of um, services in BSL as a, as a disability issue. For me, it is a cultural issue and I am grateful that I am here in front of the Education and Culture Committee um, talking about a British Sign Language Bill. This is a, a language issue um, that Scotland's BSL users have their own language, um, their own associated 
um, culture with that language, and that's how um, we, should, we should deal with this issues. I mean, there are um, areas where improvements have been made around access to services for, for deaf people along the lines uh, according to that Equality Act, but I, I don't see that people who speak Urdu or, or Polish or, or any other minority language, they don't have to self-define as being disabled to then go and use the provisions of the Equality Act to access services. Uh, for me, it's firmly about in the language and culture of, of British Sign Language. And um, in, terms of the, in terms of the Equality Act, are you aware of any proposals to change the Equality Act 2010 to address BSL? Um, I'm, I'm not aware at all, but if, if the member knows something that I don't know. No, no, just... <laughs> we could send that on to me. Okay, thank you. Can I um, bring you to the issue of finance, Mark? Um, in your financial, mem financial memorandum, you, <coughs> you estimate that uh, the cost to, in staff time, for example, between 20 and 30,000 per authority um, was the estimate in the financial memorandum. Now, can you take us through how you come to that estimate of 20 to 30,000 pounds per authority for um, production and publication of the national plans, authority plans and performance reviews? Um, Yep, I'll, I'll, I'll bring Joanna in um, in terms of the, the development of the financial memorandum and questions around that. Um, it's always difficult to put a price on this kind of thing, but we did take a few soundings um, on people's experiences with implementing the Gaelic Language Act, but we also attempted to uh, quantify the work involved um, and the grade at which that work would take place. And it is, it is quite a broad range re reflecting that. So um, it's, it's based on um, an individual of, of a, a sort of middle management grade spending approxim approximately half of their time at the, the point of producing the plan. And then we factored in a bit of time for um, reviewing and reporting back to the government. Um, we also um, spoke to COSLER um, and had a bit of input on their experience with um, the Gallic Act. Obviously, local authorities aren't all the same size, and nor are they the same size as the range of public bodies in the schedule. So, a lot of guesswork involved um, uh, based on um, all the factors that we were able to determine. Yeah, the reason I ask, um, well, there's two reasons. One is that clearly, I mean, I'm, I'm looking at the government's memorandum, which you'll have seen. Um, and at paragraphs 20 and 21 in particular, and, and what it says there is that, and I, I echo this question, that it's difficult to assess whether these costs are realistic as the bill does not specify what BSL plans should cover or what process will be involved in developing them. Given that that is the case, that's correct, that um, the bill does not specify what the plans should be, um, I'm struggling as to, to understand how you would then work your way back to what the cost would be of producing such a plan. And secondly, you mentioned COSLA, uh, and at paragraph 21 of the government's submission to the committee, it, it states that COSLA believes that the upper estimate should be uh, £40,000 per authority, not £30,000 per authority. Okay, um, so the first question was on working our way back from the, the tone of the bill, which is to um, um, be quite silent on the detail of what the authority plans uh, will include. And I think Mark's already touched on the reasons for that, and that's because it's um, a matter for the government of the day to set the tone with an eye on resources and for the authority plans to, to flow fr from that. So that's why the bill's silent on that. And it does make it difficult to, to then cost that, but um, financial memoranda <coughs> are important, so we just did the best job we, we could do, and it's, it's fairly typical um, of this type of bill. On the COSLA point, um, you, you're right that COSLA did um, come to us with a figure of about 40,000, and we, we took the decision to, to rein back on that slightly because there were differences in... Um, this was based on um, experiences with the Gallic Act, and there, there were differences in the way that the two... 
bills um, were likely to be implemented. Um, and so, again, um, just in an attempt to come up with the best possible estimate, we felt that um, a more conservative figure would be, would be more realistic. Okay. Um, I mean, I won't take you through the whole, all, all of the pages and paragraphs that um, are in the government's submission. But if I go to, to the end of it, uh, I mean, effectively what it says at Table 5 on page 9 of the government's submission is that the, using the upper estimates, that the total cost um, over the period 2016 to 2020 will be in excess of uh, £6 million. Um, I'm just wondering about uh, how realistic, um, first of all, you believe that those figures are, and secondly, um, given that local authorities, for example, and other public services are under um, financial strain at the moment um, and having to make difficult decisions, whether or not um, putting this additional statutory burden on them, um, account, amounting to some £6 million, is reasonable at this particular time? I mean, it, 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 is a, it is a big top line figure. Um, but I think it's worth pointing out that it's um, shared across um, it is shared across over 100 public bodies, um, and the, the, in line with the, the government investment, they have already plans to invest two million pounds. So that would bring that figure, um, that that burden down to just over four million pounds. Um, at the outset, but I think it's, it, it basically comes down to the, 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 the government's priorities and members' priorities. If you feel that um, it's right and proper, which I do, that British Sign Language is a language of a significant proportion of, of people in Scotland and um, as a, a method of communication that it, they can all, only use, they have no opportunity to learn um, spoken English that if you decide that we should be given priority then we have to put in the resources to match that and I'm happy to see the government support it uh, with those resources. Uh, my question I suppose is that you know, you're quite right of course everything's a matter of priority in terms of politics but the money must come from somewhere and I just wondered uh, if you had any thoughts about the possible unintended consequences of making it statutory um, that uh, local authorities, let me just stick with local authorities for a second, must produce a, a BSL plan um, and then review and uh, etc. Um, do all the work on that plan. Is there a danger and let me give you just a, a small scenario that authority X spends let's just say £50,000 on this kind of area at the moment supporting uh, local deaf people, making sure that uh, services um, are available even to some extent to support people who are deaf in their area. Is there a danger if they now have a statutory obligation to produce a plan that they will use some of the money that they use currently for supporting deaf people in their area to produce the plan given the fact that they don't necessarily have money to come from other parts of their budget? Yeah, but, I mean, obviously they'll need to find uh, the resources from somewhere. I'd be very disappointed if they withdraw services uh, to produce a plan. I think that would go against the, the, the ethos of the bill entirely. This, is, this should be about the plan. Their, their plans should say out what exactly they're, um, what service they're providing at the moment and how they, they plan to go um, beyond that. I think it would be very disappointing if, if authorities then pulled funding. But the reason I ask <coughs> is clearly if you make um, a BSL plan statutory um, and obviously the bill does not talk about for example uh, sign supported English or the use of some modern technology in terms of communication effectively any money that's spent in those areas there's a danger is or not Mark, that, that the money would then be transferred by local authorities into supporting BSL plan and, uh, I mean the bill isn't exclusive about seeing um, like particular use of, of technology, video relay technology in relation to BSL that, um, that this bill is ruling it out. In fact, would encourage local authorities and public authorities to go down that route to, to save themselves money in using that sort of 
technology um, that's out there. I mean, there's no doubt that this producing a plan will have a financial impact on local authorities. Um, it will be up to them to manage their budgets. I'm open to ways of local authorities doing that more efficiently in terms of um, their consultation. I know that the government have clearly looked at this in, in depth from their government memorandum around um, whether they could change the, the authority plans to a sort of statement of intent, um, whether they could, there could be a, a national coordinated consultation or whether authorities could get together, say, on perhaps a community planning partnership basis uh, to produce plans or, or statements. So, I mean, I, I'm open to, to the government's suggestions and ways around alleviating some of those costs so that the scenario that you paint doesn't happen. We will come on to those in, in, in a moment or two, um, uh, but I want to bring in Chick Brody. Understanding the, the difficulties in coming up with uh, financial figures, I just wonder, uh, just have you been informed by what has happened internationally? I mean, what, what evidence have you taken? I mean, I know there are currency issues and inflation issues and organisational issues, but at least to inform you of the, the sort of financial circumstances which you face, has there been any uh, contact with other countries regarding uh, what they've done in terms of the implementation of these plans? Um, we haven't done any international comparisons in terms of what the sort of inputs, so to speak, um, are. I mean, there are international comparisons as to um, what services are, are provided. I mean, in Scotland, we have, at the time of the consultation, we had the 80 registered sign language and interpreters for the whole population of BSL users in Scotland. In Finland, a country of a similar population, there are 750. Um, specifically <coughs> gone to these governments and said, you know, what was the cost of setting this up? No, we haven't done any international comparisons on costs, just on sort of outputs and service provision in other countries. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Gordon MacDonald. Thanks very much, Convener. And I, I want to move on to the subject of consulting on those BSL plans. The bill requires Scottish ministers and listed authorities to consult on the, the draft plans. Given the constraints on time and the financial resources available to many public authorities, how can the Scottish Government and other public authorities ensure that they effectively fulfil their obligation to consult? Um, obviously, that, it goes back to that resource question again, I think. I, mean, I think from the outset for for government and public bodies to effectively consult, then they have to consult with BSL users. Um, and there's no doubt that there would be a, a cost to that. Um, that doesn't mean to say that I expect a public body to consult with every um, BSL user um, in their particular areas, as, as long as there was some input from British Sign Language users in their areas and like I said I am open to the suggestions that the government make in terms of collective consultations whether that's a, at a national level or whether that's a, a grouped approach um, at a more local area level in terms of a, a health board area that brings in local authorities or whether that's a community planning partnership level that brings in um, police, fire, health boards, local authorities etc. Well, on the basis that you've said that, that you know, we'd be able to streamline the number of public bodies either through the partnership or based on our geographical area, um, it's, you still have the problem that you've just mentioned a minute ago that there is only 80 people that are registered sign language interpreters. So, you know, how do you put an effective consultation? that doesn't uh, create a, a difficulty with a few organisations and, and individuals being swamped to review a whole list of draft plans? Because they, you know, they do have normal duties to undertake yeah. but in addition to what you're proposing. Yeah. I mean, that's a, it's a, it's a sort of chicken and egg question. Um, we only have 80 interpreters and if we don't do anything about it, then 
will only ever have 80 interpreters, will only ever have that level of um, capacity to consult, to adequately provide services. And so I think this is the first point in saying um, we're going to be clear about promoting the use of British Sign Language, about the, the culture that surrounds British Sign Language and encouraging um, more people to be aware and take up learning of the language, which is a long process. Um, but if we don't take act, um, action now, then we're going to be in, in a position 10 years down the line that we've still only got 80 interpreters and there's still going to be resource issues in terms of looking at these <coughs> consultations. But I think a lot of the suggestions that the government have made in terms of bringing together a, a national advisory body on BSL, that they've been clear that that should have a, a significant amount of, of BSL users themselves, that that could be a body for um, meaningful consultation. Given that uh, you, you, you've suggested that we need to grow the number of uh, interpreters, have you got an idea of how many we need and what the financial implications would be of that? Um, though the international comparison that I'd given earlier is Finland. Finland have a similar population size to Scotland and have 750 interpreters um, as opposed to the 80 that we have here. Um, obviously that's um, to grow it to that number? There are um, higher institution bodies here in Edinburgh, the Heriot Watt um, University provides those sort of learning opportunities, but the, the funding for the places isn't as widespread as you would like. And also there is the pressure as the, the pupils from Dingwall Academy um, had said when they came to see me, they enjoy learning BSL, they learn it in first and second year and then when it comes to um, third and fourth year when they have to go on to learn formal qualifications that they need to get into university and college and get on into work that because there is no uh, formal qualification that they can get UCAS points for in BSL that means that it's dropped. Um, so there's, there's a sort of block on that number ever, ever growing. Getting back onto the subject of, of consulting, the, the duty to consult takes in a large group of people, including people who are either deaf or deaf blind or have a hearing impairment. Um, how would you go about um, consulting with individuals and should there be any prioritisation between these different groups and why? Um, I, I don't think there should be any prioritisation between um, different groups. I think as long as, I mean, BSL covers, if you, have, if you communicate in BSL, that covers um, the whole spectrum of, of what you would call a deaf person, deaf, deaf, blind, um, hard to hear. And if you use BSL, you use BSL, if that's your main language, that's, the, that's who, who should be prioritised. I think in terms of con consultation and engagement, I think the committees on work and consultation and engagement in seeking evidence is an exemplar. I mean, if you look at the Facebook page, there are close to a thousand people um, on the Facebook page and um, people uploading videos of um, their own submissions in, in BSL every day. That's certainly been a very um, effective method of, of consultation and that's a pretty good model that local authorities could, could look at. There will be a cost associated with that consultation in terms of translating any responses that they get in British Sign Language. And, and my final question is, given their specific communication needs, have you given any consideration to how consultation should take place with people who are deafblind? Yeah, I mean, it's a Deaf blindness is, people use BSL who are deaf blind, it's a really resource intensive process. There are individual guide communicators, um, Deaf Blind Scotland, who hold um, consultation events, whereas uh, an organisation who focus purely on deafness could have a consultation event and one interpreter um, for the event um, every single 
person who uses BSL and is deaf and blind use, needs their own individual guide communicator, um, and that, that would be an issue that they would have to um, use their own guide communicator to respond to the consultation. Okay, thanks very much. Thank you very much. Um, Jane Baxter. Thank you, convener. Um, the bill states that Scottish ministers should set out a strategy for the promotion and facilitation of the promotion of BSL in the National Plan. The policy memorandum states that the National Plan will set out a framework for action on BSL. Can you provide further details of what you expect the National Plans to include? And to what extent would you expect any subsequent National Plans to take account of previous plans and performance reviews? Yeah, but, uh, I, mean, I think it is exactly as you say. The National Plan has to set out that strategy um, for promotion and facilitation of, of BSL. That is that's what this bill is providing. It is providing the government to set out their um, policy priorities for their, their priorities for the, the BSL community. I mean, there are a, a range of issues which affect the BSL community. I know the, the committee are, are, are taking forward an inquiry to address in one of them around the attainment um, of, of deaf pupils, which is a, is a massive issue. There is the issue around the fact that 90 per cent of children um, of deaf children are born to hearing parents, and there is no funding in place for parents, grandparents, siblings to then uh, learn BSL to communicate with their own children. So it, it will be areas um, like BSL classes, like frontline service provision and awareness of uh, staff of BSL, um, the attainment of deaf pupils. Those will be the sorts of issues that I would like to see included in the National Plan and the guidance. But like I said, um, all I am setting out is the overarching strategy that the government should promote and facilitate the use of BSL and then take forward their own policy priorities of the day. Um, uh, sorry, on your, um, uh, what was your second point again? Would you expect any subsequent National Plans to take account of previous plans and performance reviews at a rolling programme? Yep, I mean, there is a, a statutory requirement um, within the bill. Um, authorities must have regard to uh, their performance review when they are drafting in their next round of, of plans. Um, so, yeah, that is a, that's a requirement of, of an authority. Thank you. And, and following on from that, can you give the committee an indication of the types of actions you would like to see included in authority plans that would directly benefit BSL users? Yeah, I mean, I've been more explicit in terms of the authority plans um, and the legislation and some of the things that, I've, that I would expect to see um, in terms of um, exactly how their functions, how they provide services, how they do that um, in line with BSL users, how they access their services. Um, in terms of consultations that they've carried out on their services, whether that's a local authority consulting on um, something like uh, the local development plan, how that is done in relation to BSL in terms of the, the NHS, how they facilitate um, BSL users to access things like doctor's appointments, how they facilitate um, a BSL user turning up at a, an A&E department um, and things like that. So I have been more specific in the bill in terms of authority plans and what I expect them to provide. And, and since those authority plans will be used to assess progress against the national plan, have you had any discussions with the Scottish Government about the level of detail that should be included? Um, I've, had initial, I've had an initial meeting with the, the Minister just to talk um, broadly about the sort of policy objectives and the aims of the bill, but we haven't got, gotten down to that level of detail as to what um, I'd like to see them produced in terms of guidance and their national plan, but uh, that's something that I expect to, to happen as we go through the course of the scrutinising the bill. And finally, um, is it your intention that following its consultation exercise, a listed authority should make its final authority plan publicly available? Yep, again, that's one of the statutory requirements of the bill. It's in there that um, the authority must make public their, their plans. Thank you. Thanks. Just briefly, I mean, according to the bill, the authority plans 
are to set out measures to be taken by the, um, the listed authority. Now, one of the questions I asked earlier on was measurable outcomes. Uh, I'm confused. We're asking the authority plan to list measures, but they've got to take high measurable outcomes, and yet when I asked you the question, you said there were none per se, and yet you're asking the authority plans to encompass measures. <coughs> Sorry if I, if I seem contradict. Um, what I was saying is there are no policy, um, measurable policy outcomes as a result of the bill. There will be measurable outcomes in terms of a performance review. That, that's essentially that's measuring the outcomes. That's measuring the actions that a public authority has taken in, in regard to their, to their authority plan. So, I mean, that will be the measurable outcome. But in terms of a policy outcome, there's, there's no measurable outcomes in terms of that. Okay, that's clear. Thank you. Wait, can, can I ask Mark about consistency? Um, you state in, in the bill that. Um, in preparing its authority plan, it is to try to achieve consistency between that plan and the most recently published national plan. Why is there a statutory requirement to try to achieve consistency between the national and the uh, authority plans? That goes back to this, the uh, original intentions of the bill to try and um, deliver a more even spread of services, a more equitable and spare the services for BSL users so that the, the exemplar authorities, that their good work has then been shared, that's been shared through, through the government and then um, filtered down into the authority plan so that, quite rightly, a BSL constituent in your constituency wouldn't, um, would expect to get the same services as they would in my own. And the, the reason that the line says that they should try and maintain consistency is to try and get that consistency of approach across Scotland, but also still to, to give local authorities that degree of flexibility in there as well, um, that there may be a, a particular local issue and obviously to a large extent local um, or public bodies who operate on a local level will know better their their own, the needs of their own constituents than national government would. It's still, there's still that element of flexibility to allow authorities to um, vary according to local needs. Well, that's why I asked the question, because if we are trying to achieve consistency, isn't there a danger that you limit the potential of individual authorities to effectively uh, pursue um, policies which are um, very helpful locally or there are very specialist needs in that area. It may be the difference between very rural and very urban areas. It may be a number of reasons why there would be inconsistencies, but there are good reasons for those inconsistencies. And does it not effectively limit the potential authorities to um, go out and pursue those areas of flexibility if it's not within the national plan? Um, I think it gives, it gives authorities that that steer. The national plan gives them the steer on um, what government expects them to deliver. Um, but the bill in that line saying that, well, they should try and achieve cons consistency, that that line tries, that gives them that flexibility to do things um, as they see fit according to local demands and local needs. I'm trying to understand whether what you're trying to achieve here is a minimum standard for BSL users or consistency because effectively they're not necessarily the same thing. Could you maybe try and explore a little bit if that's what you are trying to do? Um, are you trying to provide the same service across the country or is it a minimum standard of service that BSL users could expect? But of course, local authorities could and other public services could go beyond that and produce uh, services which are particularly specialist or particularly locally based. Yeah, I mean, I think, I would hope that there would be a a minimum um, standard that would that would develop, and that that would be um, that a BSL user could be able to access a, a local service in in their own language. That would be what I would ex expect, or what I would hope to see um, happen as a minimum. Um, the government will be able to set out the priorities on 
uh, national objectives as well. Um, and some of those measures that I gave in my answer to, to Jane Baxter. Um, but I still think local authorities have the flexibility with um, that line in the bill to pursue their own individual um, localised needs. I'm, just, I'm sorry if I'm not, I'm not understanding, but are, are, are you saying that you are what you're trying to pursue here through the bill as a minimum standard? Or not? I mean, the overarching aim of the bill is to promote the, the use and understanding of, of BSL, so it's hard in a way to, to say that there's a minimum, a minimum standard. Um, but I could come back to the committee um, with some more. Sorry, I'm sorry to press this point, but you've been talking about consistency and, and in other answers to other members um, on the basis of service provision. Um, you were talking about, in, in response to me, you talked about the consistency of service that BSL users would expect. If we're talking about service provision, that seems to me, or it sounds like, we're talking about there has to be a minimum standard. Um, and, and, the, and the bill itself is not really about that. That's why I'm getting a little bit confused. Thank you, Joanna. I think, I think you're right. It's very difficult to, to look at and understand the bill without um, linking it to service provision. But actually, within the bill and on the face of the bill, there is nothing on service provision. It's about the production of the plans, which I think you identified. Therefore, the, there's no point in having a national plan if it's going to be stand um, on its own and be completely unconnected with local plans. So, whilst um, listed authorities have the scope and the flexibility to tailor their plans to the needs of, of the, the people whom they serve, it's, um, th it's important that the national plan sets the tone and has some influence over those plans. So it's creating a, a linkage which at the same time allows for flexibility um, and in terms of service provision, that's a step well beyond the bill itself. No. I hope that clarifies. I understand that service provision is, is beyond the scope of the bill, but given that's the response that is being used to try and explain this, that's why I'm, I'm a little bit confused. No doubt as we explore the evidence, I think this, this may become clearer because I think it's an important issue, and particularly for those uh, BSL users across the country to understand what the scope of the bill is actually uh, intending to achieve. Um, it's, um, it's all very closely linked with the aspiration for, for what will re result um, once the bill is enacted and, it, and it's, it's difficult to look at either side of that in isolation. Colin Beattie. Yeah. I'd like to explore a little bit more around uh, performance review. Um, you've already said that in terms of outcomes you're expecting no policy outcome to come from this. There are no policies to be, to be developed as a result of this. What, if I was a BSL user, what would I expect to see as a benefit arising from this bill? What outcome would I see? Um, as a BSL user, and I hope this will come across clearly when you take evidence and the evidence that's already been garnered through the, the Facebook page is that you value my language, you value my culture, and um, that you put British Sign Language on an equal foot, footing um, with spoken English, with spoken Gaelic, and that um, BSL is recognised and the use of BSL is promoted right across Scotland and is, is, given that right, um, is rightly given that focus by also establishing that government minister for BSL as well to push forward that in um, all areas of policy and um, government policy. But if I turn to the actual bill, it states that the performance review should draw on the national plan and authority plans to provide, and I quote, an account of measures taken and outcomes attained. But what outcomes are you looking to measure there? Well, it would be the measures that the local authorities include in their own plans, like I said to, to Mr Brodie, in terms of uh, measurable outcomes. There are no measurable policy outcomes um, from, from this bill. Um, there are those aspirations and the policy directions that the, the government of the day may or may not 
choose to to pursue the, the performance review will be um, a particular public authority stating in their plans here's what we do to um, provide services to BSL users here's what we do to here's what we plan to do to improve on that and the performance review then taking into account uh, whether they've met their own objectives or not now the bill also says that the performance review should highlight examples of best practice and where there exist examples of poor performance. Who's going to do that evaluation? I mean, obviously the, different, uh, the 117 different uh, uh, participants here are going to put together their own plans and so forth and put them forward. That's all going to be brought together into one performance review, which is laid before Parliament by the Scottish Ministers. So, Who's going to do that evaluation of best practice? Who's going to evaluate poor performance? What will the measure for that be? What will poor performance be? What will best practice be? Well, that will be the, the government minister who is responsible for, for BSL and um, will take forward that performance review when reporting to, to Parliament on those outcomes. The, the sort of best practice um, and the standards will, will follow from that. Um, national plan where the government set out their guidance and set out the, um, their priorities um, for BSL and the performance review will be um, how local authorities' plans and their actions um, then match up to that government ambition. So, so deviation from the national plan would constitute poor performance? But not deviation but failing to meet um, any specific policy intention that the government have decided to, to pursue through the national plan, if they've um, decided to take a course of action, if they've funded that um, policy through the national plan and, a, and an authority fails to meet that, I think that would be right that the government would report on that to Parliament. Now, I talked about uh, the a performance review being prepared and laid before Parliament by the Scottish Ministers and that performance review draws together the performance of the Scottish Government and the 117 listed public institutions. Uh, but can one performance review covering such a, a wide range of institutions effectively, realistically capture the, any, the, the activity and progress and outcomes that are being achieved? Can it actually do that? Isn't it too big? Um, I don't think so. I mean, uh, we all undergo uh, the, the scrutiny of the, the government's budget every year, a £30 billion project which we managed to bring together into um, a performance review and it's nowhere near that scale. I don't think it's unrealistic to expect um, the government to um, pull together and they've suggested their own method of doing that using a, a BSL advisory group um, pulling together the performance reviews of, of authorities and bringing that into to one document. I don't think that's beyond the, the wit of uh, the Scottish Government. What, what mechanism do you envisage the Scottish Government to use to review the performance of these listed institutions? Well, I mean, the Government have, have set out, they've, they've given an example of how that could work by using the the BSL, uh, BSL advisory group to assist with the actual mechanism of collecting and analysing performance reviews against authority plans. I think they've helpfully set that out for me. Now, there's to be no statutory sanctions for non-compliance with the legislation and I think the only possible sanction is uh, naming and shaming. Do you think that's a sufficient sanction for non-compliance? Yeah, I mean, like I said at the outset, I think that's the ethos behind the bill was about um, promotion, encouraging um, about the positive aspects of BSL and it, its culture. I think a formal censure or, or sanctions regime sort of runs counter um, to that approach. I think I don't think any local authority or public body uh, want to see themselves um, being spoken in Parliament in an unflattering way. I think um, that the naming and shaming approach is, is enough to, to make sure authorities are um, 
carrying out what they say they will in their own plans. Do you have an example where that uh, approach has worked in the past? Um, we have the example of the, the Public Audit Committee. Um, the Public Audit Committee do not have any formal powers over um, public bodies that they, um, they look into the, the, the spending and governance of them. The Public Audit Committee table a, a report um, on the Auditor General's um, report and if that is a hard hitting report and um, a rebuke on the performance of that particular public body then they stand up and, and take notes of Parliament. Okay, thank you, Colin. Um, can I just check something? You've mentioned a couple of times about the, the guidance that will be produced by the Scottish Ministers. I just wondered um, if you could outline for us what you envisaged that such guidance would include. Um, I'll say that before, I think that's it's really a matter for the government. It's up to them that as to their policy um, priorities for British Sign Language in Scotland, what they feel they can um, resource. Um, but I, I think that that guidance could sort of set out um, what they expect to be included in a, an authority plan um, as, as a minimum or even perhaps a, a template um, authority plan to go some way towards um, reducing the burden of costs around developing um, a plan. And I know as well that the government have sort of indicated their preference for, a, for an authority statement um, rather than a, a full formal um, authority plan and that is something I am happy to have discussion with the Minister about. Um, I think this goes back to the question, or the, the discussion we had just a moment ago about service provision. Um, I am trying to envisage what would be in uh, guidance <coughs> uh, to um, those preparing authority plans which would not be about service provision. If it is not about service provision, what would, what would it be about? It be about the content and the structure um, of of the plan, it would be um, exactly what we have. Sorry to interrupt, Mark, but what would the content be? In, in, in your view, what would the content be of those plans? Or that guidance, sorry. But, I mean, it, it, goes, it goes back again to the government priorities. I do not have access to the government per strings, so I could not commit to a particular um, policy direction that the government would um, include in their national plan and feed down through guidance to to public authorities. Um, it would depend on their um, political priorities and what direction they choose to, to take the promotion of, of BSL as a language. I accept you are not the government and obviously it is up to them to decide what they put in their guidance but you must have some view about what you, know, what you would like to see in such guidance because I am struggling to understand what would be in the guidance beyond um, a government saying to local authorities, for example, or other public bodies, these are the, and I go back to my questions on minimum standards, these are the minimum standards we expect, uh, this is the kind of services that BSL users should expect. Uh, if it is not about that, or is it about that? Is that what you expect to see in those? If the government choose to go down that route and set that minimum standard, that will be, that is up to the government to do so. I mean, I said earlier, I haven't had any. I've had a maybe an hour-long meeting with the minister to, to discuss the overall um, policy aims of the bill. I haven't had any detailed discussion with the minister as to the guidance and what um, they would reasonably be able to include in that guidance to set that policy direction. I think that guidance will it will follow on from what is included in the bill as to. And what local authority plans should should include in terms of how they exercise their functions and providing services to BSL, how they include BSL users in uh, consultations, and what services they provide specifically to BSL users. Okay, thank you, uh, George Adam. <coughs> no. Good morning, Mark. Uh, I would like to ask about the publication of the plans, particularly the cycle of uh, the publication. The first plan uh, for publications 
cycle, differs from what will be the future ones as well? And has there been any thought into streamlining the whole process to four to five years? Yeah, the reason why um, the cycle changes was to give the, the government more time to develop their, their initial national plan and a consideration that after the first plan has, has been developed that subsequent plans are, are, are taken into account of the, the performance reviews and that that would take um, less time than the initial plan. The reason for the cycle being as it is was um, purely to make sure that the government who drafted the national plan was the same government with the same political, political priorities who would carry out the performance review. Um, so, I mean, really it was just an arbitrary number based on the parliamentary cycle to make sure, like I said, that the government was assessing its own performance rather than a new incoming government assessing the performance of a, a previous government who may have may or may not have a different um, set of priorities. Uh, that's an area that I've had discussion with the Minister and he's, he's mentioned the difficulty around uh, the Gaelic Language Act and the, the five-year provision in there being a bit tight for time that they feel. So I'm open to the suggestion to lengthen that cycle um, as long as that's based in the evidence that that makes it um, a more productive exercise to then move away from the original policy intention, which was, like I said, to have um, the same government reviewing, reviewing their, own, their own plans. Okay, thanks, Mark. Uh, do you think the Scottish Government and listed authorities uh, should translate their plans and consultations uh, into BSL? Yep, I, I do think they should translate their plans into BSL. It, it's not something that is in the bill itself. Um, that would have been an additional cost. That would have been um, more finances in the financial memorandum. But I mean, at every stage, I've produced the consultation in BSL, produced the, the responses analysis. The bill itself has been released simultaneously in BSL. And I think the government have be, to be congratulated as well on this, that they have committed to um, amending the bill and providing that resource to make sure that, um, that, the, that the plans are also produced in, in BSL as well. So um, I welcome that. That last bit, sorry. Um, the government in their memorandum has in, have indicated that they would prefer to see the plans produced in BSL and um, they have revised the, the financial um, implications and are, are content with those and um, to see those produced in British Sign Language. Thinking, uh, Mark, is the fact that if it is not in the actual uh, bill itself, how are we going to ensure that the authorities and the Scottish Government would actually uh, put it if it is not in the Act itself? And if you are saying the finances and the financial memorandum are available for it, then why have we not got it in the bill then? I didn't have it in the bill purely um, because it was trying to keep the, the costs of the bill as, as, low as, as low as possible. I'm happy to accept the, the government's amendment um, for that to be the case, since it's them that will be the government that will be footing the bill. Um, I'm more than happy. I mean, I think the government have been really helpful. They have um, strengthened. Uh, the bill with a lot of their, I think they've made seven um, comments on the bill and I think four out of seven have been areas to strengthen the bill and strengthen the legislation and one of those is in terms of producing the, the national plans in British Sign Language and I'm more than happy to accept that amendment. Okay. Thank you. Can I just, um, before moving on, just push a little bit on the comments and I know you you said you'd be open to discussion on the timing or the time scale for publication. Um, now, the government have suggested in their, their, their submission to us, um, at paragraph 17 in particular, they talk about the fact that uh, the, uh, under the timetable set out in the bill, there is just over a year between the publication of the first authority plans and the first performance review, which would leave insufficient time to gather meaningful information on performance. And there is only three and a half years between the publication of the first and second national plan, 
three years between publication of the first and second authority plans. Now, that does seem a very tight uh, time scale. Now, you've said you're open to discussion. <coughs> now, obviously, the government goes on to point out the, the five-year cycle for the Gaelic language plan and the fact that uh, uh, those who are producing those plans say that that's too tight, five years, and the government suggests a cycle of seven years and produces a table at the bottom of page five of their evidence as to how that would work. What's your view on the proposal as laid out in that paper that's been submitted to the committee of a seven-year cycle? Yep, I mean, like I said, that that sort of five-year cycle that I'd set out was um, purely so that the, the process could be linked to a parliamentary cycle. Um, if there are practical um, difficulties in terms of that cycle being too short, and obviously the government has that experience with the the Gaelic Language Act, I'm happy to accept a government amendment to, to lengthen that cycle. Thank you for that. That's, that's helpful in terms of clarity. Uh, Neil Blivy. I'd just like to ask about uh, the provision for deaf-blind BSL users. Uh, there was talk about um, in the consultation document about the needs of deaf-blind BSL users, uh, but I know it was uh, not mentioned in the, the actual bill. Um, can I ask you, is, is it your intention that the needs of deaf-blind BSL users could or should um, be specifically mentioned in the plans, and if so, in what way? I mean, deaf-blind people, it's not in the text of the bill. I mean, the bill specifically talks about BSL users, and that covers um, a, a BSL user, whether they are um, deaf, hearing, deaf-blind, it covers the full spectrum. So while um, deaf-blindness isn't specifically mentioned in the bill, I think there's it's my intention that they are covered by the term BSL user. Um, we do mention specifically um, deaf-blind people in the, the policy memorandum and that we would expect um, a consultation to take into account their needs, but realising that while BSL, um, while the, the population of BSL users is, a, is at around, or we think it's at around 12,000, deaf-blind BSL users is a smaller, again, group with much, um, a much higher resource implication with an individual guide communicators. Okay. Yep. <clears throat> Can I ask you about one thing um, which the government doesn't agree um, with the bill on, and that's the um, appointment of um, a designated minister with lead responsibility for BSL. Um, why, why do you think it's necessary to use legislation to do this? I think that, that was in tune with the, the overarching aim of the bill. This, again, that, I, think, I hope this will come out in evidence from, uh, that you'll take from individual BSL users that uh, they're proud about their language, they're proud about their culture, um, and they want to see a much greater focus in, in government. Uh, they want to see a bill that, um, that puts, that on that, puts it on that equal footing um, to Gaelic and to see a government minister um, set out as being responsible for, for British Sign Language. Uh, I mean, I think the, a, a government minister having it attached to has a her portfolio. That was my that is my um, policy intention anyway. Uh, that's what I would hope the government would would do um, anyway. So as long as the government is is setting out that there is an individual minister with BSL and has a her portfolio, then I think that meets the aims and objectives of what I'm trying to achieve. The government have stated that they, they are quite content that uh, the responsibility should be within a ministerial portfolio. Um, uh, they're clear on that, um, but they're obviously not content with the idea of it being legislated for in statute. Would you accept the government's uh, statement of intent to put that responsibility with a, a, a government minister rather than it being on the face of the bill? <coughs> yep, yep, I would accept that. that I mean, that, that both methods. Um, achieve the same outcome. So, as long as there is that stated aim and there is from the government that there would be a, a minister with BSL added to their portfolio, then I'm happy, happy with that. Okay, thank you very much. Any other further questions from members at this stage? 
Can I thank um, uh, Mark Griffin very much uh, and Joanna and Neil for coming along? Can I thank very much our interpreters uh, for the work they have done uh, on this evidence session? Clearly, Mark will be coming along later on in the day uh, to give us evidence towards the end of the bill. But can I state at this stage that the committee very much welcomes the views on the bill in written English or BSL? Um, further information is available in BSL on our website at www.scottish.parliament.uk slash BSL bill. And the dead deadline for responses is the 2nd of February 2015. As you mentioned uh, a couple of times in your evidence, uh, we have set up a Facebook page which now has over 1,000 uh, members. Uh, and I can thank everyone who has taken an interest in the bill from amongst the deaf community. We, we are receiving assistance to summarise the material received on the Facebook page and a summary document will be published after the deadline closes. Um, all of that is available. It is open to uh, members of the public to submit evidence uh, right up to the 2nd of February and obviously we are particularly keen to hear directly from BSL users across Scotland. So I just want to make, put that on the record and make sure we get as much response as possible uh, to your bill, Mark. But thank, thank you very much again for coming along at this stage. And can I suspend briefly to allow the witnesses to leave? Our next item is to consider four negative, statu negative instruments as listed on the agenda. Um, do members have any comments on any of the instruments? Yeah, Mary. Yes, um, uh, the, the one in the teachers' pension scheme, uh, we did look at that at the end of October, and I now note that, uh, uh, well, the it's to provide the implementation of the Public Services Pension Act 2013. Uh, and I'm really just wondering when these further instruments will be prepared that will complete the statutory arrangements. And uh, I suppose my next question is, what's the reason for the delay and will it have any impact on uh, the pension scheme itself? Uh, I'm just slightly surprised at the delay and I, we've not had any explanation. I'm not aware that it will have any impact, but these are entirely reasonable questions. So, um, 
if a, uh, submit a letter to the government, to the appropriate minister, maybe to ask those questions, those specific questions, are, are you content with that? Yes, yes, yes. Okay. Yep. Having been in real long and hard about... Real long and hard on the what was the sub ledge committee, now the DPLR, uh, about various errors that, that crop up in, in the production of this legislation. I mean, it's not it's really for uh, the DPLR committee, but a, a fairly strong message was sent, I know, from, from the committee at the time I was on it to encourage those that draft legislation or amendments to legislation uh, do so accurately so that those that are impacted, you know, like teachers' pension or teachers in terms of their pension arrangements don't have to go through the hiccup of having to come back and look at a redrafted orders. Okay, any other comments from members? <coughs> Okay, um, I'll, I'll, I think I'll go through them individually, um, given there's been some comments um, on these. The first instrument, and before I put the question, the first instrument is the Teachers Pension Scheme Scotland Number Two Regulations 2014, SS, <coughs> SSI 2014-292. Does the committee agree to, t to make no recommendation to the Parliament on this instrument? It's agreed. We will be writing the letter, yes. Thank you, perfect. Yeah. That's fine. Yeah. But in terms of the recommendation to the Parliament, no recommendation. <coughs> the second instrument is the Looked After Children Scotland Amendment Regulations 2014, SSI 2014-310. Does the committee agree to make no recommendation to the Parliament on this instrument? It's agreed. The third instrument is the Children and Young People Scotland Act 2014 Ancillary Provision No. 2 Order 2014, that's SSI 2014-315. Uh, does the committee agree to make no recommendation on this instrument? Agreed. It's agreed. And the last one is uh, the Education <coughs> Disapplication of Section 53B Scotland Regulations 2014 SSI 2014-318. Does the committee agree to make no recommendation to the Parliament on this instrument? That's agreed. Thank you very much. Uh, we have previously agreed to take the next item in private, so I therefore close the meeting to the public. <laughs>